Hello mountain bike friends. A little over two years ago, we made a video about all of the things you need to consider when you are upgrading the fork on your mountain bike. It's one of the most common upgrades there is, but there is a lot of complexity there in terms of steer tube, wheel size, axle, brake mounts, all of that sort of stuff. We're gonna cover everything you need to know in this video to upgrade the fork on your mountain bike. Jamie Christmas, forks. So in this video, we are gonna talk about all the things to consider when upgrading the entire fork on your bike. Obviously, when you say upgrade your fork, that could mean upgrading your air spring or your damper, um, something like that. That's not gonna be in this video. That's a little bit more technical. On really high-end mountain bike forks, you can do things like upgrade your damper or your air spring or add tokens or things like that, which could be considered an upgrade. Uh, Push Industries makes some really cool high-end upgrade dampers for very expensive forks. But in this video, we're gonna talk about the things to consider when you're upgrading the entire fork on your mountain bike. Um, we're gonna go over steer tube type, wheel size, offset, axle, brake mount, and everything else. So you can see right now the timestamps on the screen if you wanna pan around and get to a point where you need, or you can just watch the whole thing if you wanna learn all about this. Uh, let's jump into it. The first thing we're gonna talk about is steer tubes. You do have to get all of these things we're gonna talk about in this video correct in order to make sure the fork you buy fits your bike. But uh, one of the key elements there that we're gonna talk about first is steer tubes. Most modern mountain bikes all have what's called a tapered steer tube. And what that means is that the bottom is a 1.5 inch and the top is an inch and an eighth. Um, tapered. So again, this is the absolute most common that there is on modern day mountain bikes. There of course is on a little bit older bikes um, or let's say cross country bikes with a steel frame or something, a straight steer, which means it's an inch and an eighth all the way through like this. Um, less common, but again, very important to know which one you have so it fits your bike. On much older bikes, you can get into things that are like threaded steers. Jared, bring in an example. This is a giant Sedona. It has a threaded inch. There's an, there, at one point there was an inch threaded, then there was an inch and an eighth threaded, then there was an inch and an eighth threadless. Uh, this is a quill stem. If your bike has that, I don't recommend upgrading your fork. You should probably just ride it as it is, have a great time, save some cash for a whole new bike. That's steer tubes. Help me help you. Next thing here is travel. Um, this is a very important thing to talk about. Travel for your bike, you're basically the manufacturer of your bike, specifically engineered your frame to work perfectly with a certain travel fork, which means you should probably stick with that because a lot of engineers spent a lot of time designing that frame around that travel fork. You can, of course, go a little lower or a little higher. We do not recommend going more than 20 millimeters in either direction. So that means if you've got a hardtail with a 100 millimeter travel fork, don't go any lower than an 80 mil travel, don't go any more than 120 mil travel. If your bike is designed for a certain travel fork and you go lower, you're gonna steepen the head angle, lower the bottom bracket, lower the whole front end of the thing, and that's gonna give you a very different feel. And vice versa, if you go more, if you add travel to to what your bike is intended for. It's gonna lift that bottom bracket, lift the whole front end of the bike and slacken out that front end, front head angle. So it will change how your bike works if you change the travel of your fork. So definitely something to consider. But again, we really, really do not recommend going more than 20 millimeters away either direction from what your bike was intended to use initially. So keep that in mind. Every bike, you know, sort of is designed around a specific travel fork. It's pretty easy to figure out. You probably already have one on your bike, or you can figure out pretty quickly from the manufacturer's website what bike brand you have, what it's designed for. There's obviously a ton of different travel forks out there, all the way from 80 and 100 millimeter ultralight cross-country forks like this thing um, to your 
170 millimeter, 38 mil stanchion, beautiful super enduro forks to your 200 millimeter travel dual crown forks, which are pretty much exclusively made for downhill bikes. Um, typically the front fork travel is going to match the rear travel on the rear end or be close to it. You don't really see a huge amount of variation there. Again, the biggest thing to keep in mind is what was that frame engineered for initially? Um, those manufacturers, those engineers, hopefully know what they're doing and they designed it right. So don't go too far away from that. That's travel. Another key element to consider when upgrading the fork on your bike is what wheel size are you looking for? So you want to get a fork that corresponds to the wheel size that you have on your bike. For instance, if you have a 26 inch wheel bike, you want to go with the 26 inch wheel fork. If you have a 27 and a half inch wheel bike, you want to get a 27 and a half inch wheel fork. But if you have a 27.5 plus bike, you probably want to get a 27.5 plus slash 29 fork and that'll do the job for you. But basically when you're looking at forks, you just want to go with the fork that corresponds to the wheel size on your bike and then you'll be set. Okay, the next thing to consider is offset. This is typically specified in the product title and in the description of any fork you're looking to buy. Offset wasn't really a thing until uh, maybe a decade ago, Gary Fisher actually came out with what they called their, I believe it was G2 geometry, and they pretty much just changed the offset of a fork on their 29 inch wheeled bikes when 29ers were just becoming a thing, uh, basically to make that offset work better for the larger wheel and the geometry of that bike. Since then, it's continued to evolve. Different brands have designed bikes around different offsets, and now forks are offered in different offsets. It finally seems like Bike brands are settling on what offset they want to use and what works best for 29 and 27.5. Um, but who knows? We'll see. It could change in a couple years. Uh, we made a whole video called Fork Offset Explained, um, sort of detailing how the offset actually changes the handling of the bikes. And we also wrote an article as well that showed like detailed images of how when you change the offset of a fork, the trail changes and sort of the steering dynamics of the front wheel change as the offset changes. But nonetheless, like most things we've said in this video, get the offset that your bike was engineered around. So if your bike was engineered around a 51 mil offset, go with that. If it was engineered around a 44 millimeter offset, go with that. It's not necessarily something you want to mess with when it comes to if your bike was designed for a certain offset, you should very likely just stick to it. Um, so keep that in mind. And again, most modern day mountain bikes, because offsets become a much more real thing in terms of a fork attribute in the last couple of years, the brands will specify what offset you need, um, hopefully on the model page of the bike that you have, and then you can just upgrade your fork and get that. So don't worry too much about going away from what your bike was designed for. When you're upgrading your fork, it's much more about weight, performance, adjustments, feel, all of that sort of stuff, and then matching sort of the attributes that that bike was engineered for. So there you go. That that's offset. Okay, next up is the axle on your fork. This is a very important thing to also get right. I wish I could say there are some common types or one's the most common, but there really isn't. Um, I think probably the most common on modern mountain bikes these days is the 15 by 110, what's called a boost axle. So mountain bikes originally had a quick release, also known as like a nine millimeter axle. Um, that's not a through axle. Then it went to a through axle, just regular 15 millimeter by 100. Then it went to 15 by 110 boost. And that's probably the most common, but there is also uh, 20 millimeter axles for downhill bikes, 20 by 100. And there's also a 20 millimeter boost axle, but that's really rare. Um, again, pay attention to what axle you have. Um, most of the forks that you see laying, all these forks are through axles right here. And you do need to measure your hub and figure that stuff out. If you wanna see what a quick release axle look like, that's on a little bit older bikes. That's these babies right here. So you could basically upgrade your fork and use a different axle standard than like what's used on there currently, but you're gonna have to either use adapters to modify your existing hub to get to that standard or use a different front hub or front wheel as soon as Jeff gets this front wheel off. Yeah, so this is a quick release right here. 
They're a bit older, they're really flexy, and there's a reason that they don't exist on high-end modern mountain bikes these days, and through axles do exist. So if you do have a bike with a QR axle and you're upgrading your fork, two things to consider. One, should I upgrade the entire bike? If no, it's still a good frame. Then the next one is, should I upgrade to a fork with a through axle, and then do I get an entire new front wheel, an entire new wheel set, or do they have available hub adapter kits for your hub? May or may not happen, but it is very common. A lot of people run into this problem, and we help people out with that situation all the time. Right, Jared? That's true. Yeah, give us a call, shoot us an email, ask us any questions you got. Mm -hmm. Yep, just like that. <laughs>Brake mounts. This is another really important thing to figure out. So your bike right now has some type of brake mounted to it. If you've got a more modern high-end mountain bike, it very likely has a post mount. So what that means, uh, it looks like this. It means that your brake caliper adapts to the fork with just two bolts that go directly into the fork right here. This is a post mount. These are not all created equal. So most, uh, most post mounts on shorter travel forks, let's say 80 to 140 mil are a 160 post mount, meaning you can put a caliper on here and a 160 rotor and you need no adapter. Um, however, if this is a 160 post mount, for example, because this particular fork is a cross country fork, if you wanted to put a 180 mil rotor on here, um, you would need a 20 millimeter adapter. So keep that in mind. Now, longer travel forks, like that Fox 38 right there, it's got a post mount 180 or post mount 200? 180. Post mount 180, which means that 180 millimeter rotor goes on there and the brake caliper mounts on there, no adapter. Again, if you wanted a 200 mil rotor, you need a 20 mil adapter. So that's how that works. Figure out which post mount you have if you have post mount. Some of the other common types are, well, I don't really think they're any common. Post mount is the most common now. Um, years back, uh, they made what was called an IS mount, which is, what this old guy has here, uh, that's where you have basically two bolts that go perpendicular into your adapter, which goes like that, then your caliper mounts to it. Wasn't the best design, um, that's why they kind of got rid of it and now everything went post mount. Um, and then of course, depending on the price range of your bike, you might have caliper or V brakes, which is what this bike has, and you have mounts right here. So if you do have caliper or V brakes, obviously, and you wanna keep those brakes, you gotta do that. Or if you wanna get a bike with that doesn't have those, a fork without those, then you need to get disc brakes. And yeah, a lot of things to consider here. So uh, ho hopefully that all made sense. The very last thing we have is how much should you spend an airverse coil? So if you're looking at upgrading your fork, there is a ton of options out there and a ton of price points. We've made videos on a ton of the higher end forks. We've also made a video on the best forks that you can upgrade to that are under $500. And they do change a lot. So typically, under 300 bucks, you're gonna see a lot more coil forks. They're obviously gonna be heavier and they're gonna have less adjustments. So as you sort of go up the food chain in, in the price range of mountain bike suspension forks, uh, you're typically gonna see them get lighter, fancier in terms of more adjustments and looks and all of that sort of stuff. And uh, yeah, they're, there could be a little bit of complexity when it comes to adjustments and which ones are necessary and which ones are not necessary, but adjustments and those kind of features really do pile up on you as you get towards the higher end segment of forks and the weight typically goes down, uh, which is really cool. Forks have come a long way, so it's definitely something to consider. Air versus coil, that really does depend on riding style. So almost everything now are air forks, even a lot of downhill forks and super enduro forks up to 180 millimeters of travel like the Fox 38 are air forks. Um, coil is actually pretty common on um, sort of like free ride and dirt jump forks and lesser expensive forks. Um, but MRP makes a really cool coil, coil fork as well because coil is claimed to have some really interesting sensitivity features, but every time coil gets really good with sensitivity, the air springs kind of catch up to that sort of feature set. But anyways, that's that. Uh, we have a lot of other videos on suspension forks comparing the different top brands and all that other stuff. So check that stuff out. Link below in the video description. Thank you guys for watching. Hit that subscribe button and we'll see you in the next one.